think we're we're also waiting for Darren to to get back in here. So yeah. I'm Maria. Allen. Here. Anderson. Here. Hancock. Hertzberg. Here. Lou. All right, we have a quorum, and uh, appreciate the members coming, and we certainly hope that um, we're in touch with Senators Lou and Hancock about coming. Um, and then Darren is here too. So uh, the first item on the agenda that we'll be hearing is SCA 14. And uh, what I wanted to just first mention, it seems that there's been a request to, to um, have a stenographer uh, record this proceeding. So I'm happy to accept the uh, request, but I want to say two things. Uh, the first thing is the common practice is to ask for permission of the chair in advance. And so, I'll, you know, just to let folks know that in the future, please make sure to do that. And second of all, we would appreciate a copy of the, of the, the transcript afterwards so we can, you know, have it. Uh, but with that, I'm, I'm happy to uh, uh, accept the request for the stenographer. And with that, we have Senator Hertzberg here to present Senator Wilk's SCA 14. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Senator, last week, Senator Walk asked me uh, to present, as she wouldn't be here today, and I'm happy to do so um, on a personal level because I have been personally involved in this issue with her when before when I was out of government and when she was chair of the committee that I now chair, deeply involved in these issues of budget reform. Um, and I wanted to be able to, and I'm glad to have the opportunity because I have some historical context uh, with respect to this measure and other measures that uh, are part of, of a larger discussion about the reform process. Um, so this measure in, in, in broad terms, as, as you have before you, we'll certainly talk about the details as we go forward, uh, provides a, a, that, that the the legislature provide at least 72 hours notice um, of a measure in its final form before taking it up, seeking to avoid what is commonly referred to in the legislative parlance as gut and amends. And secondly, it deals largely in, in, together in conjunction with, with Assemblymember Gordon's measure with the whole uh, ex a notion about um, the requirement that uh, to make the proceedings of the legislature both available uh, and public. Uh, and there's some question about how what the depth and dimension of that is in terms of it's all proceedings, standing committees, the floor, all, many, most of which is already recorded. I believe this committee is being recorded today. Is that correct? Yeah. So these are important discussions, but let me let me frame it because it involves a lot of groups with whom I have been involved with for years. A lot of reform groups, Common Cause, others in, in this larger discussion. Uh, we have for many years been dealing with this whole issue of transparency before government in, in, in the legislative branch of government. We had a measure of which I was a co-chair of uh, that was on the ballot in 2012, which included, among other things, the precise provision that we see here today, uh, 72 hours notice. Certainly it was one of many items, no question, but it is something that we spent a lot of time with in former groups, not-for-profit groups that I was involved with, looking at this whole larger issue, trying to build a consensus and trying to deal with this t challenge that we face about these, these gut and amends. I personally have a view that is uh, uh, that result that, that it certainly, and you'll hear me talk about this over the next number of years as long as I serve in government, of how the legislative branch has to change its rules and then hence avoid gotten amends because we in fact deliberate uh, things in a much deeper way in committees and let committees hold on to bills over long periods of time and have series of hearings ultimately to be able to really deliberate the kinds of issues that we need to deliberate and, and give the kind of thought that we need to do to the public policy issues that we face and not be limited by whoever the author is or the single subject rule. There are much larger and deeper discussions, but so one of the unintended consequences of this that we've seen since Jess Unruh adopted this rule of uh, of how the legislature works on these time deadlines is these gotten amends, where at the last minute bills without having hearings, without going through the process, are gotten and amended, and often without much notice. And so what this measure seeks to do and what we sought to do in 2012 um, was to 
was to at least give a minimum of three-day notice so that parties would be able to understand what's before them. Because often, and I've certainly seen this in my tenure being involved in government, folks uh, introduce stuff at the last minute. You don't really get to know what it is or see it, and it's not fair or right in the process. Um, now, the, 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 the last thing I want to say about this is, is that it's important to understand that there's an interrelationship between our role as a legislature in trying to write the law and the initiative process. Um, this constitutional amendment by Senator Walk is being introduced, I think, in you know, no small measure in response to a ballot measure which is going on the ballot now. I think that's a fair and honest statement. Um, and Senator Walk has been involved in these issues, as, as the proponents know, for some period of time. Well, as part of this tension that exists between the public's important right to be able to make the law or to question what we do, and the power of the legislature to act responsibly is this initiative process, and we used to have in the law what was called the indirect initiative. Um, it was taken out under, under Proposition 1A in 1966 when we professionalized and, and, and full, made the legislature full-time, and we brought it back um, in last, was it last year before last, I guess, with, with Senator Steinberg's Bill 1253. Now, what was the purpose of that, and how does that relate to what we see here now? A group of, I believe it was 64 groups, came together and spent a year and a half. I, my, according to my records, when I looked at my computer, I had 2,674 emails involved in this process over a year and a half, back and forth. And from labor to, to the legal women voters, to common cause, to, to, to the, the, the Coward Jarvis group and the like, sitting down for this period of time under the guidance of former Chief Justice Ron George and Justice Cruz Reynoso, giving us guidance and legal advice, trying to figure out how we can bring back the indirect initiative. And the purpose of the indirect initiative and why it relates to this right now is that we've passed it. And what that means in large measure is the right to claw back, the right to withdraw. So that what happened before in the old law was that proponents, for whatever their motivations were, would come before the voters by virtue of getting signatures out in front of a grocery store or whatever it was. They'd put something on the ballot. The way the process worked in the old days, in the last 25 or 30 years, was by the time those things were actually before the legislature, we were at the end of our legislative session. So by virtue of this 1253, this SB 1253, we required folks that had 25 percent signatures to give notice so that we harmonized the relationship between the policy discussions on the one hand in the legislature and the efforts by groups to try to put initiatives on the ballot. So where we are today as a result of what we see before us, I think it's fair to say, is that the legislature with Senator Walk, who has a history in this area, me presenting this bill, who has a history in this area, saying to the proponents, you know, you've had an influence, you've had an impact. I don't think that but for what they have done uh, that we would have this before us because quite frankly, these are hard kinds of things to, to change, these kinds of rules and why gut and amends exist. We, I think, know some of the challenges with respect to that. So now we're faced with an issue where we have before us um, a, a measure uh, it, not exactly harmonized. You'll hear it from the opposition. I saw the, the comparison charts of where the differences are, but I think that in taking a look at those, uh, you know, certainly I don't have the authority to take amendments now, but I think it's certainly there's an opportunity for discussion to be able to avoid putting this on the, it will be put on the ballot, but by, by as a constitutional amendment by the legislature, which is a better thing to do. Um, the, the, the differences are really twofold in large measure as I see them. Uh, one is is the notion that that the gut and amends are only in the final um, determination. Um, the the experts with whom I've briefly consulted with, and some of the organizations I used to be involved with, are concerned there's some uh, litigable issues in that regard because there's uncertainty as to how it's defined in the initiative. But basically, the idea is that if there's a gut and amend in the first house. Um, it, it doesn't. It's not subject to the 72-hour notice rule as proposed in SCA 
uh, 14, but it's only in the final analysis. Well, the truth of the matter is, is that we all know as a practical matter, there aren't really gotten amends in the House of Origin because stuff gets passed through the House of Origin to the second house, and gotten amends are always in the second house and how it works. But I think there's flexibility in that regard if that proves to be a point. The second issue is who pays for and how extensive the disclosure is, and uh, Assemblymember Gordon can talk about that with respect to his measure, but really the, the issue is, is this something that comes within the purview of Prop 140? that limits how much money constitutionally the legislature gets, or is this something that can be paid for, meaning the cost of doing these productions uh, outside of the, in the general fund? You know, my judgment is that it, you know, it would be nice to have it just within the legislative branch, but someone who served in management roles of these, this body, or these bodies, uh, it, the, the, the challenges are so much great. And the last thing we want to do is to have a chilling effect on, on the ability to have as many hearings and to spend as, you know, and, and be as open as possible where the legislature is saying, well, I don't know if we can have these extra hearings on and, and, and broadcast these hearings for a select committee or for this other proceeding because of budgets, because, you know, you've got to always ask the leadership for permission for, for the hearings. And so in the, in the scheme of things, there, the, the differences in my judgment are pretty de minimis. I think that the author, and certainly me as one of the voters on this that coming down the line, are certainly open to making changes. Changes. But the end of the day is what's important here is there's tension that exists between folks that go out and put stuff on ballots because they think the legislature doesn't work. It's legitimate. It's true. I get it. I'm not denying it or think it's inappropriate. The question is whether the circumstances are tasteful or not shouldn't be the discussion of what we do as a legislative branch or what the proponents do. The question is, do we end up with public policy that moves incrementally in the right direction, which is what this measure is doing? This measure is much more narrow than the measure that I was involved with on the ballot in 2012, Proposition 31, uh, um, which is probably smarter uh, to be more narrow, but it also faces a number of challenges. And, and to the extent that we in government should always be responsible and try to work together, whether we were dragged there by horses to get to the trough is not the issue. The issue is where are we and what voter experience will there be on the ballot and trying to limit the number of initiatives. You know, it's been, and you've heard me talk about this in this committee before with respect to other initiatives. It worries me tremendously that when the budget is too long, I mean the budget, when the ballot is too long, it undermines confidence in government. We have a, a sacred right of the initiative and people will never give that up. I have poll tested that. I, when I was in government before, I had a commission on initiative process. I've been through this in the private sector, and initiative process review, and people will not give it up because ultimately they want that power. But at the same time, they don't want to be emburdened with have voting a ballot that's 30, 30 pages long. So there's a tension there, and I think it is important, and I think what Senator Walk is doing here is important. And I understand, and I completely, personally relate to the frustration of the proponents of the measure. I only will say to you as, as the committee that I think from talking to Senator Walk's staff, from conferring with her, and from knowing her in the past by virtue of working on this issue when it wasn't popular and she couldn't get stuff out of this house, that she's willing to work on this. And I just, I close with a quote that when you walk into my office, you will see this in my reception area, and I pulled it out, and it's a quote. It says, on compromise. We shall need compromises in the days ahead, to be sure. But these will be or should be compromises of issues, not principles. We can compromise our political positions, but not ourselves. We can resolve the clash of interests without concealing, conceding our ideals. Compromise does not mean cowardice. Indeed, it is frequently the compromiser and conciliators who are faced with the severest tests of political courage as they oppose the extremist views of their constituents. JFK Profiles and Courage, 1955. I share that with you because that's what we're asking here today, what Senator Walk is asking, and asking of this committee and asking of the proponents of the committee and of leadership that I understand is supportive of these of this, these measures, you know, to step up to the plate and to fix the rules as they should, and to tell the truth to the public, to the proponents, to realize that, yes, it is not always the easiest way to have to go out and spend a bunch of money and to go out and gather the signatures and be prepared and hire the political industrial complex people of the process to be able to go out and fight your battles for you, but that the idea at the end of the day is that we serve the public. We serve the common good. We serve the public interests. I think that's what Senator Walk is doing with this measure, and I'm certainly happy to answer any questions and to respond to the opponents of this measure. Thank you so very much for your patience for my long introduction.
No, I appreciate that a great deal, Senator. Um, I think you did a good job of covering the major issues at play. So, so um, do you have witnesses in support? Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members, Paul Smith with uh, the Rural Counties Association. Our membership is the uh, members of boards of supervisors in 35 rural counties, uh, and we do support this uh, measure. We have supported uh, uh, each of Senator Woke's efforts as it relates to imposing a 72-hour uh, in-print rule. Um, as you can imagine, the 72-hour in-print rule is, is very understandable for boards of supervisors because under the Brown Act, they have to live with that uh, requirement. Uh, and particularly in rural counties where everybody knows everybody, um, when you do not adhere to that, uh, you get flack at the grocery store and where else. We think this is a good measure. We understand uh, exactly as Senator Hertzberg has put forth that this is a compromise measure. To be frank, we very much appreciated the previous version, but we think this is uh, still a very, very good step in the direction in transparency. Uh, keep in mind that uh, for final things to be acted on at the Board of Supervisors level, you have that 72 hours. Um, obviously, in the spirit that I think Senator Hertzberg said is we are looking at that final close, right? That, that second house when really the chips are down and and the bills are really uh, before us, um, that's when the full disclosure needs to be made. The same is true at boards of supervisors. There's a lot of times conversations behind the scenes uh, with one uh, staff member, one supervisor, maybe out in public where uh, things are, are, are talked and bannered about. But the requirements of a 72-hour in-print rule are there when final action is taken. Um, so we think this is a good measure. We think it's the step in the right direction. We appreciate the spirit of compromise, and we encourage the legislature to move forward. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Jimmy, we're with the California Newspaper Publishers Association. And like the Rural Counties Association, we too have been supporters of uh, Senator Wolk's previous efforts and, and last year's uh, amend assembly uh, effort. Um, <clears throat> and um, some of our individual members, as you may know, have been uh, somewhat critical of the gut and amend process over the years. Um, we think that this is a good step. This is a good approach that uh, it would create more time for journalists and the public to review amendments that come um, before the body um, and allow not only uh, the public and journalists to understand, but legislators as well, uh, what they're about to, to vote on and, and about to do. Um, it also provides uh, additional expertise from outside um, to help uh, uh, inform those efforts. And all of this strengthens the integrity of the legislative process in our minds. Uh, we are aware of the criticism uh, of the approach to only provide this in the second house. Um, that is where most of uh, this type of activity occurs. Um, but we also are supportive of uh, amendments that would clarify that there are some situations where bills may originate uh, in a house, especially at the end of session. Uh, and uh, we are supportive of that effort and look forward to taking part in the discussions um, as to the applicability of those, uh, the appropriate appropriateness of those. And uh, we urge you to um, uh, send this on so that uh, we can engage in those discussions. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Other witnesses in support? Uh, Gavin Baker with California Common Cause. We are neither in support nor opposition to the bill, but just providing comments at this time. Uh, we thank the authors for bringing this bill. Uh, this is a really important conversation, and we're glad that the legislature is joining it. Uh, as you heard, this is very similar to the California Legislature Transparency Act. Uh, we do have a support position on that initiative, and if it appeared on the ballot, we would urge voters to vote for it uh, as it has been filed. Uh, but we have also supported other approaches to this issue in the past, like ACA1. So we're open-minded about the different ways that this could be done. The main thing is that we don't want to see two competing measures appear on the same ballot. So we hope that that won't happen. Uh, and we encourage the authors and the proponents to continue discussion. Um, we do have some concerns with the bills as currently drafted. And most significantly, we believe that the 72-hour transparency period should apply before a floor vote in either house, uh, which is the way that the initiative would work. We think it's important that legislators have the opportunity to read a bill before they're voting on it, and that constituents have the opportunity 
to give their views before their legislators are voting on the bill, and that includes both their representatives in either the Senate or the Assembly, not just one or the other. Uh, we hope that these issues can be addressed, and we hope that uh, a consensus solution can be reached. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Hey there. Uh, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, I'm Trudy Schaefer representing the League of Women Voters of California. And like the representative from Common Cause, I'm explaining that the League has not taken a position on the bill, but we would like to make some comments. Um, we do appreciate the uh, effort to increase the transparency of the legislative process. Like Common Cause, we are also supporters of the initiative, and we also were strong proponents of the Ballot Initiative Transparency Act that Senator Hertzberg referred to. And for that reason, we do hope that a continued conversation will go on. We do think that this is something that should be negotiated in good faith, and we hope that that will be, continue to be the, the case. Um, we do have some concerns, and so at this point, we thought it best that we point them out. A major one is that we also believe that it would not serve the public or good policy if we were to end up with two measures on the, on the ballot. And for that reason, um, we, we, all we can do is urge both the proponents of the initiative and you uh, as legislators to uh, move forward in, in whatever discussions you need. But we do think that the danger of the public being confused is too great when there are two measures that are essentially, uh, to the public's eye, very similar or even the same. Um, we also have the major concern about the 72 hours of, of published uh, before a, a floor vote can be taken, and we do feel that it ought to apply to both houses. This is a case where we really have legislators who don't have a chance to understand what a bill is, and, and that's not serving either the legislature or the public. The public won't have had the opportunity to see really what's in a bill, and uh, they can't expect that their, that their representatives will be doing their proper job, even in the first house. Um, we know that Common Cause has called to your attention a number of points that need clarification in our minds. We've had some similar conversations, and so uh, we would refer you to that. And then finally, uh, the provisions, one, one aspect of that perhaps, is that we're aware of at least one provision that's in the statutory part of the initiative, but is in the constitutional amendment, SCA 14, and uh, assume that that was done in order to make it harder to amend the, the, those provisions. There could be others, and I think the proponents would probably speak to that. So I would just say that that, again, is a topic for your discussions. So thank you very much for your attention to this, and we hope that the negotiations will move forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair members. Mitch Seaman with the California Labor Federation. Um, we don't have an official position on the bills or the initiative, and so we're here less to talk about the pros and cons of either, but really more to highlight the merits, we believe, of the legislative process as a way to deal with these issues as opposed to the initiative process. Um, as all of us in this room are painfully aware, the legislative process offers a lot of different ways to improve potential legislation and all sorts of ways to take the time necessary to make sure that we're doing everything right, that as we learn more about an issue and we learn more about how the statutory change should be worded, what amendments should be taken, what should be taken out, what should be put back in, the legislative process for all of its flaws offers a lot of great ways to make sure that at the end of the process we've got the best possible statutory change that we can come up with. Um, and the fact is that the initiative process just doesn't do that. While we're very supportive of the initiative process and have been very involved in it in the past, we've sponsored a lot of legislation around it. We're actually sponsoring legislation this year around the initiative process. The fact is that you kind of are stuck with your first draft. And then as the process goes forward, as you learn more about it, there's really nothing you can do. And you wind up with law that leaves out all of the benefits of the legislative process. And as much as you might like to improve it, you're just not able to. And so while we think the initiative process very much has a place and is a worthwhile thing that should continue, um, there are times when it's not appropriate and not the best way to deal with issues. And we think the ones at hand with these two bills and at hand with the initiative are the kinds of issues that are, belt, that are best dealt with through the legislative process um, and in the interest of good government and in the interest of allowing the legislative process to benefit from the debate and benefit from the time and all that we learn about an issue through it, we think that the legislative process is the way to deal with these issues and we hope that all involved can find a way to make that happen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Dane Hutchings with the League of California City is also um, in line with um, the other folks' comments. We have not taken a position on uh, SCA 14. 
at this time, but we'll point out one technical difference that um, applies to, that is encapsulated in the, in the ballot measure, but is not in this measure, is that it is our understanding that SCA 14 does not apply to any special sessions that are happening. So, um, you know, uh, you know you, you're, you're legislating or regulating the regular session, but mm -hmm. when the governor calls a special session, you know, sort of the same House rules apply, and that is uh, one of the concerns that we had in reading, in reading the measure. So just something that we wanted to point out on a tec technical issue. Look forward to the conversations continuing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have witnesses in opposition? Seeing and hearing none. <laughs> For the stenographer, that was not me saying seeing here and then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sir, 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 sir. Yeah.